Surviving a helicopter crash, he was captured by the Viet Cong in December 1967 and spent almost five and a half years in various prison camps, enduring torture and the harshest of conditions. His story is featured in the Ken Burns' powerful series on the Vietnam War. After returning to the United States, Dr. Kushner continued his medical practice and in 1986 retired from the Army Reserve as a colonel. A recipient of the Silver Star and inducted in the Army Aviation Hall of Fame, Dr. Kushner has also served as a surgical fellow in Peru and as a visiting surgeon in the Dominican Republic, India, Tanzania, and Turkey. He also participated in a medical mission to Haiti, all places of very importance to Clinton School students' international project work. A true public servant and a true American hero. Please welcome to the Clinton School, Dr. Hal Kushner. Thank you for that great introduction. I didn't know whether he was going to introduce me or breed me. Um, good morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm flattered and honored to be invited to such a prestigious venue. Just a glance at a partial list of former speakers, from athletes and actors to statesmen and Nobel laureates is enough to provoke a sense of intimidation and anxiety. So instead of speaking to you today, I thought I would just sing a song. <laughs> but there's no shower. I only sing in the shower. <clears throat> I'm not a famous person. I'm just a small town doctor. And before that, I was a soldier. I'm a veteran. There are 22 million of us. And we made an agreement and we pledged our lives to defend our country and its principles. The first sentence, the very first sentence in the Code of Conduct is, I am an American fighting in the forces which guard our country and its way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. That's the first sentence. It's a very simple, clear, declarative statement. We swear an oath. I was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. I have the dubious distinction of being the only American physician captured in that very long war. I was captured on 2 December 1967. I was released to American control on 16 March 1973, 1,932 days, under unspeakable conditions, pain, suffering, sickness, starvation, and humiliation. Half of us died. Those words, I am prepared to give my life in their defense, were almost constantly in my mind. My son, uh, Mike, is now 49 years old. He'll be 50 in April. He was born four months after I was captured. I never knew he was born, never knew he was a boy, never knew he was healthy until I met him when he was two days before he was five years old. My daughter, <clears throat> Tony Jean, who is 54, she was barely potty trained when I left. And when I came back to her, she was nine and a half and then the fifth grade. But before I was captured, I was deployed with a famous helicopter unit, 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry. We were involved in daily combat. And in fact, I replaced Captain Carl Schnepp of Memphis, Tennessee, whose name is inscribed on panel 18E, line 36. He was killed in action several months before I replaced him. Each day, my medics, and there were 17 of them, would go out on operations in helicopters with infantry troopers that we call blues, blues. And the medics wore standard helmets without red crosses, and they carried sidearms and M16s to protect themselves and their wounded. Of those 17, 13 
were either killed in action or wounded badly enough to be evacuated from the theater. Often, our helicopters return from action with those gray-green body bags with corpses of GIs zipped up inside, very frequently with seriously wounded GIs and sometimes with enemy POWs who we treated and stabilized right next to Americans and then we sent them to a more advanced facility. We lived on an LZ, a landing zone. It was carved out of the jungle with bugs and snakes and stifling heat and cold rain. And we took quinine for malaria and we had halogen tablets to purify our water and we took Kool-Aid to disguise the taste of the halogen tablets and we dry shaved or we shaved in cold water every day. We ate sea rations in the field. My favorite was a fruit cocktail. And the cases of seas had those little cigarette packs with four cigarettes in them. Everybody remember those, right? And a little baby roll of toilet paper. And those things were completely unavailable to a prisoner of war. I had soldiers uh, in my squadron that were spread out all over Vietnam for 350 miles. I had a permanent aid station in the rear, and I had two aid stations in the forward area that were sandbag tents. We had uh, what we called a QRF, Quick Reaction Force. Each man had a specific task in case of an emergency, like an attack. My, my task was to get my helmet and my weapon and jump in the command bunker with our squadron commander, Colonel Nevins. So one night in the rain, we got mortared, and I grabbed my helmet and my weapon, and I jumped in the bunker, and I was suddenly armpit deep in muddy water, and there was no Colonel Nevins. And I hear this chirping sound. It was pitch black. I pulled out my trusty Zippo and lit it, and the thing was filled with rats. So I jumped out of the bunker, and I went back to my sandbag tent, and Colonel Nevins never left his connex where he lived. So I thought we had it rough, and then, and then I got captured. As President Kennedy said, there's always inequity in life. Some men are killed in war, and some are stationed in San Francisco. Life is unfair. The same young martyred president said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. We took this very seriously. He said, we will bear any burden, pay any price to, secu to secure the survival and success of liberty. And then on the night of 30 November 1967, in a driving rainstorm, a helicopter went down over enemy territory. The pilot, a friend of mine, was killed on impact. The co-pilot was seriously injured. He went through the chin bubble of the Huey helicopter and his right tibia and fibula, bones in his lower leg, were sticking through the nylon of his jungle boot. The crew chief was knocked unconscious, but thrown clear. I came to in a burning helicopter. I unbuckled my seat belt, and I almost broke my neck because my helmet was plugged into the commo system, and the airplane was absolutely upside down, which I did not realize. I tried to free the pilot, not knowing he was dead, by cutting his seatbelt with his own knife, and I couldn't. The airplane was burning up, and I couldn't. And I jumped from the helicopter, and by the light of the fire, I could see the other crew on the ground. And the chopper just burned up quickly in a big whoosh. It didn't explode, it just whooshed. And then, only then, did I realize that my left collarbone was broken, my left forearm, the radius and ulna, two bones in the forearm, were fractured. I had no glasses, and I had lost a bunch of teeth. Turned out to be seven. And I had burns on my legs and back. The M60 machine gun in the, in the chopper had cooked off a bunch of rounds, and I had several holes in my left shoulder and back. We had no supplies. We had two 38 pistols with six rounds in each pistol. We had a severely wounded warrant officer, a moderately wounded flight surgeon, and everything else had burned up. Burned up. I splinted the co-pilot's leg with tree branches and an army belt, 
and I tied my left arm to my body in what's called a Velpo dressing uh, with my army belt. And we made a lean-to from the door of the helicopter, and we spent the cold, rainy night huddled under that door. The next morning at first light, we sent the unhurt crew chief for help. We thought we knew where we were, about 10 miles west of Friendly's. Later, six years later, six long years later, I learned that the crew chief had been found shot dead and submerged in a rice paddy about 10 miles from the site. Well, the rule is you stay with your airplane, and that's what we did for three long, rainy days and nights, could never see the sun. The poor co-pilot was so brave and in a great deal of pain. We had nothing to eat but rainwater that we wrung out of our clothes or licked it off of leaves. On the morning of the third day, 2 December 1967, this brave young warrant officer just slipped away, passed away. When he died, I took the compass from the burned out helicopter and I moved east by the compass down the mountain. I fell once in a dry riverbed and I cracked a couple of ribs on the way down. When I got to the bottom of the mountain, the sun came out finally and I looked up and saw that I had not gone east, I had gone west. The compass was broken and there were helicopters hovering over the mountaintop. They found the crash site the next day, and they noted that the co-pilot had been, quote, professionally splinted, and thus they assumed I was alive and not critically injured. I was weak and I was sick, and I walked about a mile, and I saw a man in a rice paddy working. He ran up to me and he said, Dai Wee Bok Si, Dai Wee Bok Si, which in Vietnamese means Captain Doctor, because I had my fatigue jacket on with a caduceus in my rank. And he saw me and he took me, uh, he led me a short ways down a path and he found a hooch and we sat down outside the hooch and he gave me a can of sweetened condensed milk and a sea ration can opener and a sea ration plastic spoon. And I opened it and was eating it. It was the best thing I'd ever eaten in my life. And I just started eating it when a squad of 14 VC came upon me and the squad leader shouted in English, surrender, no kill, surrender, no kill. And he made a motion like raising his arms. And I put up my right arm and I couldn't put my left arm up because it was tied to my body with the belt. And he shot me right through the left shoulder with an American carbine. Knocked me way back. They ran up to me. They took all my possessions, ripped off my dog tags and I had a chain around my neck. Uh, my father had given me a medallion with a St. Christopher's medal on one side and a Star of David on the other. And they took that and I showed him my Geneva Convention card which identified me as a medical personnel. It was white with a red cross. And he tore it up and he said, no POW, no POW, criminal, criminal. They took my boots and they tied me very tightly with camo wire in a duck wing position like this, and they marched me to a cave, and a young man beat me with a bamboo stick, and we stayed there until nightfall. And then we marched at night, only at night, we rested in the daytime for 30 days. I was tightly bound, we walked on rice paddy dikes at night, and I couldn't see a thing and they would strike these little homemade lighters and by a few sparks they could see where to walk, but I couldn't and I kept falling off these rice paddies which are about a foot and a half or two feet wide into the water and they would haul me up by my bonds. It was rough. My feet were lacerated, my wounds were festering and full of maggots. I had fever and I just didn't care Artillery would come in and they would dive for cover and I just kept upright. I just, I just didn't care. Uh, we stopped at a place and this old man came out. They took my, they untied me and he tried to take my uh, fatigue jacket off and I was holding it. I didn't have an undershirt. It was all I had and the guards made me give it to him. I thought he was going to take it for a souvenir and he actually washed it in a river and dried it over a charcoal fire. And then he took a cigarette and he burned all the leeches off of me. I had about a thousand leeches on my legs. And he gave me the jacket back. It was 
an o oasis of kindness in a desert of cruelty, and I think about it now and I get emotional. After about two weeks of walking, walking west, going higher and higher into the mountains, we came to a clearing and I saw bamboo cages with women and children and men in them tied up. I guess it was some type of prison, I never knew. A day or two later, we came to a clearing where there were wounded men and hammocks, and I thought it was like a field hospital. And this female came out, and she had me lie down on a log, and she gave me a bamboo stick to bite on, and she took an AK-47 rifle cleaning rod and heated it up into a fire, and she just put it right through my wound, through and through, and it... It was very, very painful, and it sizzled, and it smelled, and it's been 50 years, and I still shudder when I think about that. And she put mercurochrome on my wound, which was a big hole the size of a silver dollar in my shoulder, and she gave me one aspirin tablet, and I thought, what else can they do to me? And I was to find out. After a few more days of marching, they, they put me in a hut with a very small, uh, emaciated Asian man. He spoke a language that wasn't Vietnamese, and I don't know what he was. He coughed all the time, and I assumed that he had tuberculosis. And the next day, I'd been in there with him for 24 hours, the next day an English-speaking officer came, the first one that I'd seen, and he had a portable, a small reel-to-reel -reel battery-powered tape recorder, and he gave me a cigarette. He said I could make a message to my family if I would condemn the war. And I said that I would rather die than make a statement against my country. And he said words that were the most profound and prophetic words. He said, you will find that dying is very easy. Living, living will be the difficult thing. And then he went away. And the next morning, we left in a driving rainstorm. And the guards wore these little plastic ponchos, and I didn't have anything. And we were going higher and higher in the mountains. And I was weak, and it was steep. And they used ropes to actually pull me over some of the areas of the mountains. I just couldn't make it. And two days later, about 30 or 31 days after I was captured, I arrived in my first camp. I'd expected a big stalag with searchlights and a hospital and where I could work in hundreds of prisoners and Red Cross packages. What I found was a muddy clearing by a stream in the jungle with a few thatched hooches and four of the saddest looking American creatures I had ever seen and 12 Arvins. Arvin is Army of the Republic of Vietnam. They were South Vietnamese soldiers. They were filthy and frail without shoes dressed in black pajamas that were raggedy with matted hair and beards and rotten teeth. And they told me that four months before, an American captain, a Special Forces captain, had died in that camp. Although we moved the camp frequently, always within one or two days march, which was 20 to 30 miles, that mountainous jungle was to be my home for three and a half years. It was triple canopy jungle. Our ration was three coffee cups of rice per day, which we cooked. And it wasn't nice white Uncle Ben's rice. It was red mountain rice that had been cached in the jungle and mountains for years and years. And it was shot through with rat feces and weevils and stones. In the four-month rainy season in the fall of the year, the ration was cut to two, two cups. And for two years, the first two years, we had no shoes, no clothes, no blankets, no soap, no toothpaste, no tobacco, no medicine, no nothing. And it was cold. We were up in the mountains, 5,000 feet altitude, and half of us died. We died. All in all, 10 Americans died. Three of five West German nurses who were captured, male and female, probably mistakenly, of, of, the, of the three of the five died within two months in our camp. So all in all, there were 13 deaths. Ten of them died in my arms. 
One man was executed after being recaptured in an abortive escape attempt. He was brought back to the camp and shot right through the head in front of us. Another man uh, was recaptured. He was brought back. He was put in stocks in his legs. He had to actually defecate in his hands and throw it away. He was beaten very badly, and he died about a month later. When a man died, we made coffins of bamboo, and we dug the grave, and we buried them, and we marked their graves with rocks and bamboo crosses. And I can report to you that every single one of those 10 Americans have been repatriated. And the last one, Lance Corporal Dennis Hammond, didn't come back till 2004. And they lie <clears throat> in the shadow of their families, in the soil of their country, where they should. So all in all, I was forced to sign uh, 14 death certificates in Vietnamese. I have no idea to this day what they said. We were subject to intense indoctrination. They built a classroom in the jungle with table and benches, and they had these propaganda officers come in and indoctrinate us. And we were promised relief if we made progress. And there was a big sign saying, freedom of speech is necessary in the debate. But when I said that Ho Chi Minh was a puppet of Mao Zedong, I was pulled out and beaten severely. Then a political officer promised me higher rations if I would work in a Vietnamese hospital. He told me that American doctors who had been captured in World War II, particularly in the bulge, had worked in German hospitals. I didn't believe him and I refused, and I'm glad I did. I stayed with my own men and we took our chances. Our captors tried to separate us by race and indoctrinate us differently. They gave up on that quickly. We were all Americans and we stayed together. They tried that for about two months before they gave up on that. We all slept on one bamboo pallet. And there was from five to 20 men on it, depending on how many people were captured and how many were alive. And we were all sick with malaria and dysentery and we vomited and defecated and performed our bodily functions on this one pallet, and we were nursed and cleaned by our fellows, and we helped each other. We took care of each other. Uh, on holidays, we sang patriotic songs, but very quietly, so our captors couldn't hear. We had one book, a Catholic Missal, that was issued by the United States Marine Corps that they let one guy keep. He was captured with it. It was, a, it was small and fit in the blouse pocket of his utilities. But they tore the first two pages out. First page had a picture of the American flag. The second page had the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, during the day, we did slave labor. We carried wood and rice, and we dug and built bomb shelters. There are lots of stories. In the monsoon of 1968, five men died within a few months. I thought I was going insane. We just needed nutrition and fluids and vitamins, protein. Our camp was a muddy morass, and it was littered with piles of human excrement because we were just too sick to make it to the latrine. We starved to death. Men just starved to death. So we decided to eat the camp commander's pet cat. We lured it down to our compound, and we killed it. And it was late at night, and we skinned it and cut its head and paws off, and we were boiling it in a pot. About 2 a.m., and a guard came down and asked what we were having a fire for at that time of night. We said we had killed a weasel, thrown a rock at it, and we were cooking it. And then he found one paw that someone had neglected to bury, and he immediately identified the paw as belonging to the camp commander's cat. And things got very, very serious. They, mu they uh, mustered the guards and the cadre came down with rifles and sidearms strapped on. They lined us all up. And after a few minutes, one guy admitted that it was his idea. And so he was pulled out of the line. He was beaten very severely. He was kicked to the ground and they continued to kick and beat him. And they pulled me out of the line, 
tied my hands and beat me in the face with fists, but I didn't go down. And they hung the carcass of the cat around my neck and hung me and tied me very tightly and hung me from the roof of a hooch for one day. And then they tied me to a tree for another day with this carcass around my neck. And I was so crazy, I thought they were gonna let me eat the cat. But it was not to be. The fellow who was beaten so badly died two weeks later. He had, he had recovered from the beating, but he just gave up. And he was in coma. And I had been sitting with him for over a day and night. And about three o'clock in the morning, he woke up and he focused his eyes and he said, Mom, Dad, Sis, I love you very much. Box 10, Doberly, Louisiana. Well, uh, I was released in 1973. I went to Doberly, Louisiana, and I talked to his father. His parents had been divorced while he was captured. Never saw his mother. I went to see four or five of the families of uh, the men who died when I came back. I called the others. There was only one lady in Danville, Illinois, that didn't want to talk to me. All the other parents, uh, very grateful for the call. So in Tet, you know what Tet is, the Vietnamese New Year, 1970. The Vietnamese uh, celebrated they killed a water buffalo. And they had invited the local Montagnards. The Montagnards were mountain people who were like a, aborigines. They were like our Native Americans. Except they were very, very primitive. They, they wore loincloths, they carried spears, and they shot crossbows. They had no written language and no calendar. And they came, and when they killed a water buffalo, they would give us the parts they didn't want, like the eyes or pieces of the lips or the face or the skin with the hair on it. Uh, but this particular time, they gave us hard candy, gave us about 30 pieces of peppermint candy. And we had not had sugar in two years. We had had no sugar. Well, the Montagnards brought this fellow that was afflicted. He had cerebral palsy and he was mentally retarded. And they shunned him and the Vietnamese shunned him and he wandered down to our compound. I don't know who it was, but we decided to share our candy with him. And so we decided to show him what Americans were like. And we divvied out the candy like dealing cards and we included him in the division. And I have never been more proud of being an American. We had nothing, and we shared it with somebody in bad shape. So by 1971, only 12 of us were left. 27 people had been through the camp. Our captors were talking about moving us to North Vietnam because we were dying and they wanted some bargaining chip if the war ended. And then we were in a B-52 raid, uh, and it was the most frightening, terrifying thing. I mean, trees were uprooted and shrapnel as big as a man, white hot, is flying through the jungle. And the concussive force is great enough to knock you unconscious and provoke bleeding from your nose and ears. And so they decided ASAP that we were going to North Vietnam after that. And they divided the 12 of us into two groups, six and six, fast and slow. I was in the fast group. And we walked to Vinh, a railroad terminus in North Vietnam. It was 900 kilometers, and it took us 57 days, the fast group. It took the slow group 180 days. And for a large part of it, we were shackled. And when we slept at night, they put iron manacles on our feet and our ankles and our wrists. So we slept in manacles. And we, when we got to the DMZ, we crawled across it. I mean, there was a lot of artillery and bombing and stuff like that, and we, it was uh, dangerous. But we all crawled safely across it, and then we walked up to Vinh, which was 180 miles from Hanoi. And they put us in a railroad boxcar with hundreds of Arvin POWs who had been captured in an operation called Lamsong 719, an incursion into Laos. 
On the way, on this 57 days of walking, I had stolen a uniform, a khaki uniform that was hanging on a clothesline, and I had folded it and put it in my pack. And when I was on the train, I slept on it to press it. It took 18 hours to go the 180 miles in this boxcar. And when the train stopped, I threw my, the, the grimy suit I had on, the pajamas off, and I put on this khaki uniform. I wanted to look like I had dignity. And I took some water from somebody's canteen and I combed my hair with my hand. And so these people met us with jeeps and I walked off in this press uniform with my hair combed and I thought I had dignity. And they put me in this jeep and took me to a, a old French prison called the Plantation, took all six of us to this place. And they put us in a room. We were sick. They weighed me there, and I weighed for the first time, and I weighed 44 kilos, 106 pounds. It was the only time that I was weighed. And after about three or four months in this cell with my fellows from South Vietnam, they moved me to another cell with only officers. It was 10 by 14. There were six wooden pallets, and we slept on the pallets individually. There was a single light bulb in the cell and a speaker, a loudspeaker, and a slit in the door that the guard could open. And in the summer, there was no window. And in the summer, we roasted. And in the winter, it was cold and damp. We had no books and no writing material. They played propaganda through the loudspeakers. And when Americans like Jane Fonda or uh, Pete Seeger came to North Vietnam, they spoke over the loudspeakers. There was a bucket in the cell for a latrine, and one man got out once a day to empty the bucket in a cesspit. We passed notes to each other through the bucket. We wrote on the notes, we wrote with rocks on pieces of scrap paper that we picked up. Once in a while we would find like a pen, the insert to a ballpoint pen outside, and we would use that. We got out twice a week for about 30 minutes to bathe in a well. We were fed twice a day with a small bowl of pumpkin soup, a small piece of French bread, and two cups of hot water. There were no letters or no packages, but no one died. No one died. Life in the South each day was a, just a constant struggle for survival. In the North, it was a cruel jail, but no one died. We were forbidden to talk to people in other cells, and if you did, you were punished and beaten. And it was, uh, but we had a rank structure. We talked to people in the other cells by knocking on the wall in a certain code. We had a tap code. And we had a senior ranking officer that we knew about, but had never met. In December of 1972, we heard B-52s overhead and bombing really close by. And they bombed Hanoi to smithereens. And we began to cheer. We knew something was happening. The camp commander came down the next day with a pick and shovel and gave it to us, said he could no longer guarantee our safety, which was pretty rich since half the men in my camp in the south had already died. And we dug, we had a cement floor in our cell, and we took that pick and shovel and dug a bomb shelter through it. It was hard work, but then we put the pallets, the six pallets that we slept on, over the hole in the bomb shelter, and the next night when they bombed, we jumped in the hole with the pallets over us, and we were still cheering. My comrades and I are convinced that that's what brought us home, Operation Linebacker II, the Christmas bombing. A few days after that, the peace was signed. <clears throat> Our rations immediately increased. We were given reading material, and we were all moved to the Hanoi Hilton which was only a few blocks away, but they blindfolded us and shackled us and put us in trucks, rode us around for four hours, and then took us to the Hilton. Of course, I looked under my blindfold, and I could tell that it was only a few blocks away. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were released in groups. I was in the third group. <clears throat> and in February, a month after the peace was signed, I received a Red Cross box. I know exactly what was in it. It had a book in English, and 
it was and my first and only letter from my mother, but she didn't tell me about my son. I think she had written me and my family had written me a thousand letters and they I think they thought they already knew it. <coughs> On March 16, 1973, I was taken about with 75 others to Jai Lam Airport <clears throat> of Hanoi, and most of us had been captured five years or more. So they gave us this little uniform of, to be released in. It was a windbreaker and a little short sleeve shirt and blue pants and black shoes, cardboard shoes, and they gave us a little AWOL bag to carry stuff in. <clears throat> we hadn't you know, if we had been captured over five years. We had a senior ranking officer, Colonel Ted Guy, Air Force. He lined us up in the shed in the airport, and he said, I want every man to carry the bag in his left hand. I want you to unzip your windbreaker one-third of the way, and when you march out, I want you to look like soldiers. This is after five years, five and a half years of being captured. But we didn't march out together. We marched out individually. Colonel Guy didn't know that at the time. So we were kept in the shed and our name was called individually. I marched out <clears throat> into bright sunlight and in the background, I saw this huge white and gray C-141 star lifter, this magnificent bird with the American flag painted on the tail section and USAF on the fuselage. And I was absolutely overwhelmed with emotion when I saw our flag. I almost fainted. I hadn't seen it in over five years. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I went forward and there was an Air Force Brigadier General in Class A uniform. His tunic was ablaze with ribbons and he greeted me and I saluted him, which was after all a military courtesy that had been de denied us for over five years. And we shook hands. And then he hugged me. He actually hugged me, and he was crying. There were tears on his face, and he said, Welcome home, Major Kushner. We're, glad, we're so glad to see you, doctor. And what I thought about him was that he, had, he actually had thickness. He had breadth. He had meat on him. And we were like scarecrows, and we had straw for hair. His hair was plump and gray beneath his overseas cap. So they flew us on the C-141 to Clark Field in the Philippines. We had emergency medical care. They made me an artificial uh, temporary bridge of seven teeth. <clears throat> Gave me some glasses. And after three days, we went to Hawaii, Hickam, the place I was born and the place I had interned, Hickam Field in Hawaii. And I had sworn while captured that if I ever made it back to American soil, I would sing God Bless America the minute I landed. And so we came out at, a, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, and there were 1,500 people there to greet us, including a lot of reporters. In those days, reporters didn't have to be neutral, so they sang along with me, God Bless America. They, everybody joined in. Uh, I returned to my family. I met my son for the first time just a few days before his fifth birthday, two days before his fifth birthday. And I was in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, in um, Valley Forge General Hospital, off and on for four months. I had several surgeries, and uh, we were all sick with lots of stuff. And I went back to duty in August of 1973. I had returned in March. I remained in the Army and I retired from the Reserve and I've had a really very successful ophthalmology practice down in Florida thanks to Dr. Schock who trained me. And I don't have PTSD and I've never had a nightmare or flashback and I am not defined by my captivity. It was a bump in the road of my life. No one gets through life without some tragedy and suffering. And I just feel lucky. I am lucky. I survived a non-survivable plane crash. I survived two bullet wounds. I'm the only survivor of the POW camp I was in who was captured before 1968. And in the end, it just comes down to luck. I was fortunate to survive when so many braver and stronger and better trained men did not. 
I have done medical missions all over the world, and I just feel so very lucky that I was born an American. I, I love my country so much, and I'm just so proud and honored that I could serve it under the most difficult circumstances and return with even more love and devotion for my exceptional America. <clears throat> I have to tell you this. There were 12 survivors of my camp in the South out of 27, 12 American survivors. In October of 2017, which is just a couple of months ago, my wife Gail and I sponsored and hosted a reunion for us. Three of the 12 have died, that leaves nine. One was a collaborator, not invited, that leaves eight. One was sick and couldn't come, that leaves seven. And one is lost, we think he's moved to Europe, we don't know where he is. So that leaves six, six men and their wives, and two of them brought grown children and grandchildren, and there were 16 in all, three white and three black men and their families. Three white and three black. We had not been together since release, we had never met each other's wives. We had a great banquet in a fancy uh, uh, restaurant in Orlando. And each man got up and spontaneously spoke of his love for the others and how we had depended on each other and sustained each other and how none of us would have survived if it hadn't been for all of us. And in this day of terrible racial divisions and the identity politics of the age, I call it the disuniting of America, I wish the country could have seen our banquet. Shakespeare had it right as usual. You know, he has King Henry V on the eve of the Battle of Agincourt. He says, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he that sheds his blood with me this day shall be my brother. And indeed, all of these men, they are my brothers. Shakespeare knew about veterans too. He said, he that survives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named, and strip his sleeves and show his scars. Well, anybody that's been to a veterans reunion know that's exactly what we do. And we have physical scars and we have mental ones. And now in this final phase of my life, when I can see the finish, I just feel grateful every day, so fortunate that I was able to make a contribution and come safe home. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Can you take some questions? Say again. Can you take some questions? Sure. He told me to speak for 30 minutes. I'm sorry, I went over. I went over. When I practiced the speech, it took me 28 minutes. Well, I think you could have, could have kept on going because uh, this crowd obviously loved it. So we do have some time for some questions. If you would raise your hand, we'll get the microphone to you. That is, yes, we have a question right over here. Right over here. Yeah, right over here. Thank you so much for sharing your story, especially those of us who were in the Vietnam era and had friends we lost or who came home and were lost. Do you think that perhaps um, the experience of armed service and the draft, uh, that obligation to our country may have been lost? And do you have any uh, opinion of whether the draft should be reinstated? What a good question. Um, you know, I believe if you're lucky enough to be an American, you should serve your country. And I believe in universal service, not selective service, universal service. And there are people who are not cut out to be in the military, but they can do something. Or they don't want to be in the military. They can be in the Peace Corps. They can work in something like a Conservation Corps. They can do something. And I believe every person 
should serve their country. And I believe a lot of kids when they graduate high school are not mature enough to go to college or to go out in the community and work. And I think the military or something like it, public health service, is a wonderful thing. I hope they bring the draft back, but I believe in universal service. All right, other questions? It's so powerful a speech. There's a question right back there. Everybody's wiping their eyes. I can assure you, you, can, you ought to see the tears in this room. Thank you for coming and sharing your very terrible and unforgettable experiences. Uh, it's serves to remind us all. Um, my, and, and I might add, it's my conviction you're very blessed to even be here. Um, my question is, in the early days after your capture, um, did you, were you alone as a prisoner until you reached the camp you spoke yes. of? Yes, I walked to the camp. There were, I had three guards. I had three guards and myself. It was the same three guards from the, from the time I was taken to that cave the first night until I got to the uh, POW camp with Americans and Arvins. I was alone. Yes, sir. Uh, when Ken Burns asked you to be in his series, what were your initial thoughts about doing that? Number two, what did you think about the series itself? Um, I have a friend named Joe Galloway who's a well-known combat uh, reporter. Joe and I have been friends for 35 or 40 years. And he called me and he said they're going to make a series of uh, uh, the Vietnam War, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, and they are going to be contacting you because I've given them your name. So I've seen all of Ken Burns' stuff. I mean, I thought I'd seen uh, Civil War and baseball and jazz and the Brooklyn Bridge and Lewis and Clark and all that. And, you know, it's PBS, and they have a worldview that I probably don't share 100%. Uh, but when Lynn Novick actually emailed me and told me she was going to call me, and I didn't know her from Adam, and she called me. She was a very charming, lovely person on the phone. And she said she wanted to come down and see me and talk to me. And so she flew down to Daytona and she spent two nights in my house. And um, she is a charming, lovely person. And I, my first question, is this going to be politicized? And she said, well, have you seen my work? And I said, yeah. And she said, do you think it's politicized? And I said, somewhat. I think it is politicized. And uh, she said, well, no, this is, we're going to try to do the most fair and balanced thing we can do and so forth. So I said, fine. So then when I really like her, by the way, and I like Ken also, but they see the world differently than I do. And that's okay with me. And when they interviewed me, they were as gracious and as, as and since then, subsequent to that, they have been very, very nice and gracious. And I've been out to dinner with Ken several times and been to his house in New Hampshire. And the series, I think, is slanted a little bit. They, they're as balanced as they could make it, as they could make it. Uh, they found General McPeak, who was chief of staff of the Air Force, and he said that we were fighting on the wrong side, and I think he's probably the only flag officer in the galaxy that they, they would ever say that, uh, but they found him. And, um, and I think the interviewees possibly were, uh, they picked people that would tell a certain part of the story. But I think it was, it was good, it was gripping. I'm glad I was in it. Uh, it's not the film I would have made, but I'm glad I was in it. And I think they're honest and sincere, they, they are. I have a question right in the back yesterday. You had your hand up. Here, here comes the microphone to you. Dr. Kushner, what are your thoughts on the divisiveness of public service today? Divisiveness of what? Public service. Public service? I'm not, I'm not aware of divisiveness. What, what, what I mean is that the perception of, the perception of uh, public service on the part of many in the country today seems not to hold the same esteem that it did 50 years ago, 100 years ago. 
public service. Yes, sir. Not military service. Not military service. Public service. You know, I I have I don't have an opinion about that. I'm sorry. I don't really think about that. I I hold people in public service in esteem. Are, are you talking about our elected officials, our Congress? I, I, our, I'm talking about. Uh, just the general perception of people who serve in government, oh. be it at the federal, state, local, or county level. Well, you know, Thomas Jefferson spoke of the artillery of the press, and there was, I, I, I don't see that there is any more divisiveness in public service now than there has been. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't speak to that. I just can't honestly speak to that. Question right back here. And then we'll... Sir, what did you think was the most difficult uh, thing about uh, acclimating yourself back to, to life in America? Well, uh, when I left, uh, Lucy and Ricky slept in twin beds. <laughs> and there was Ozzy and Harriet. And when I came back, you know, the men had their hair down to here and women wore mini skirts and I had never seen anything like it. And I thought the television, uh, when I was in the hospital in Valley Forge, I turned on the television, I thought it was terribly vulgar and offensive. And uh, the movies, when I left, you know, they didn't cuss in the movies, nothing like that. It was, and so that was a hard thing for me. But I got over it. I mean, you know, I'm very adaptable. Dr. Kushner, thank you so much. This has really been very touching. And I was moved by your commitment to America and to your fellow man. And you talked about the disuniting of the United States, and that's very concerning to me also. So based upon your experiences, what do you suggest people do to try to change those attitudes, whether it's disuniting along racial lines, political lines, or whatever else? Well, I think the divisions in the among these, uh, this identity politics as a philosophy where they slice us up and if you're a red-headed Presbyterian, you're different than a left-handed Baptist and they appeal to these different groups. I think that has to change. You know, the, um, Joe McGinnis wrote a book that I read in the, I don't know when I read it. It's called The Selling of the President and he discusses the marketing methods they use to wage political campaigns and how they divide us all up into different races and different classes and different economic levels and appeal, have ads that appeal to that particular stripe of person. I think they need to stop that. And we need to, we need to stress our uniformity that we are all Americans rather than the divisions among us. That's what I think, I mean, I, I need to go to the School of Public Service and learn how to uh, Well, I, I, I certainly service. think you qualify for admission, I would say. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let's, uh, I want to say thanks to Dr. Schock, who I, you did a great job training this young man, I will tell you that. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it one more time for Dr. Hal Kushner.